you make your muscles tight so you can learn how to relax the muscles. The worrying and stress, we create an artificial tightness in our muscles. Just relax. The mind is relaxed and calm. Do not let it rush forward. Be patient. Every moment is the present moment. We learn to have our mind stay in the present moment. Here, there's no thought of the future, no thought of the past. Just a clarity of where you're at, where your body's at. Just relax. Be aware. You do not have to have thought. Let go of thought. You're aware when thoughts arise in the mind, but let them go by. We are clear in this moment. Patient. Relaxed. This moment as if 10,000 years. Put down the mind that seeks continuation. Rest in the present moment. No thought, just continuous present moment. You contemplate your method. You don't think of it. If you're observing your breath, just simply observe the breath. In this moment, you're clear. I am taking in a long breath or a short breath. But it is in this moment. Do not have thoughts of self. or mental impressions, mental states. They do not belong to you. They're naturally appearing, but they do not belong to you. Let them go. Let your mind relax in this moment, completely aware of everything in this moment.
mind need not think to be. Mind is always present. Always being. It is your true nature. It has no form. It creates form. Thoughts appear in mind. But we let the thoughts go. Any thoughts appearing are naturally appearing. We let them go. Just as the sun looks down upon the earth, sun sees through the clouds. As the mind settles, the clouds dissipate on their own so that the brilliant radiance is cast equally upon all parts of the earth. So too the mind sees everything in this way illuminating the environment, casting off ignorance, hatred, anger, any negative emotions or sensations. They do not make up the mind, but are formed by the mind, if not given any attention, they will dissipate. Be patient. This is your true mind. Keep the body relax. Mind relax. Simply contemplating your method. There is no thought. I am contemplating my method. The method simply appears in mind itself. Mind, looking at mind. If notions of self arise, See through them. They're temporary. 
maintain only this original mind. Never been born. Mind contemplating the method suspended in mind. This knowing mind is welcomed by mind. Like a weary traveler returning home. Content. Sublime. Continuous you need not reach be patient. In this first moment, mind is aware. And in this awareness, only your method is contemplated by mind, projected on mind. So simple. Mind returning home. Keep the body relaxed. Keep the mind on the method. Relaxation of the mind brings patience. Just staying in this present moment continuously.
remember this. When the mind strays, you will begin to lose this absorption of the mind. Gently return the mind back to this point, the present moment. A mind completely aware of all thoughts passing through, but choosing only the method. Relax the mind, relax the body. In this present moment, the mind is aware. Everything appearing perfectly in its place. body appearing simply holds upright. Other than that, it has no function in this moment. The mind has no need to engage in thought. The only thought is the method. Disentangle the mind from these thoughts. Only the method remains. Continue to stay in the present moment. Make it sharper and sharper. Keep your mind away from the present moment. 
there is nothing to do but watch the method. Stop in internal discussions. Let them go. Return to the present moment. I'm just still. Internal discussions or illusions. They take you away from this present moment. Directly contemplate their method. And in this way, you become intimate with mind. Intimate is knowing, even though the method is there, countless of thoughts also arise in mind. But because of this intimacy, we know from where those thoughts come from. We let them go, holding only to the method. This intimacy comes from the total awareness of mind. Meditation is easy if we do not pick and choose. Relax. Remember this moment of healing and compare it later on when you're doing your own meditation. Welcome to you all. I wanted to start off this morning with this taste of charm, this taste of 
of being able to have this calmness. This calmness is very special because in everything that you do, you can take this calmness with you. You're totally aware of every moment. Why we talk about walking and chan, talking and chan, eating, even sleeping and chan, working and chan. Chan is just simply this mind that is settled. It's clear. It has an awareness around it. Via body, speech, and mind, it makes knowing decisions about what to think next, what to say next, and what to do next. It measures what's there. It measures what is the most appropriate response to any arising condition. It is aware that these conditions that arise in mind come from a cause. This is what Chakamuni Buddha realized when he was sitting under the Bodhi tree was that there is this connection between everything. And as a result of these connections, there are creations in mind, creations in form, sensations, perceptions, volition, and even the consciousness. The consciousness that we think is us, that, that is our own nature, but it's an illusion. This is not easy for us to, to accept because to accept it, we have to give up the notion of an individual self. We do not understand that the mind is capable of acting without our opinion. But how many times has your opinion gotten you into trouble? You made the wrong choices based on protecting this body, protecting this body's reputation, or whatever, or just simply wanting to hurt people in some way, um, not harmonizing. This is something that is uh, continues to to give more food for the existence of the self. And causes the suffering in this world not only of your suffering, but you're causing the suffering to others. This is really pitiable and regrettable that we do that. This is not the way of the Dharma. Before I, I begin, um, I want to tell you a little bit about myself. Um, so that you understand from where I come from. I've been practicing for many, many years. I've been a searcher for many years. And I found Master Shen Yang, who imparted to me the answer of what I was looking for in my life, which is wisdom. This wisdom Sometimes we call it a money pearl, a wish fulfilling gem. But it's different because when you were young and somebody gave you this wish fulfilling gem, what would you wish for? Back then, when I was young, a million dollars would do pretty good. Now that's not too much money. Would you wish for immortal life? or the most beautiful husband in the world, or wife, or wives. What a waste, right? I remember once in, uh, in Southern California, there was a, uh, there's a very affluent uh, area by the beach, and I saw a, a, a licensed bumper sticker, or excuse me, a bumper sticker on a car. It said, he who dies with the most toys wins. 
And I went, how regrettable, how incredibly regrettable. And I wanted to put the sticker on his car saying, he, he who dies with the most toys still dies. We don't see that. We don't understand that. It's not that, that's not the goal of life. That is extremely regrettable. So what would we do with this pearl? What could we do? Would we think of ourselves? Or would we use it for a better good? It is the wisdom that helps us understand that. The wisdom comes from knowing how life works, how mind works. This is what's important. When we don't know how mind works, we make many, many mistakes. When we know how mind works, we choose wisdom moment to moment. I talk about the present moment. Wisdom is in this present moment. We choose that. This is what I picked up from my um, master, Master Shen Yang. Master Shen Yang conferred upon me Inca, which means that I had seen my nature and I was qualified to be a Dharma teacher. When he did that, I did not see that as some kind of a, of a great prize, only the commitment that my life would be in service to others. It, and it was a solemn moment when that happened. Likewise, when I became a Dharma heir of his, it too was a solemn moment. There was no big ceremony, no fancy things, no flowers, no bells, no nothing, just a simple certificate scribbled by him saying that I'm my Dharma heir. But because I had already been conferred Inca from him, I knew what was in store for me. And essentially, it was a life of service to others. That is what I'm doing here. And I put that before my own personal interest and um, and economics to come here to impart to you this precious pearl, wonderful pearl that you can have. This is who I am. This is why I'm here. So forgive me for my own introduction. I think that you should know that so you can have faith. I'm not here to to get a check or to eat the food or to ring a bell. I'm here to impart whatever I can to you of this wisdom. And what you're listening to me, I'm actually not talking to you. My wish is that whatever I say, you will impart to others. So I tried to say it in a way that you will remember it. Remember it carefully so that you may share it with others. This is Chan. This is our practice, is that we, we don't just simply come here to put down our problems. The problems, when one has a bit of, a, of an experience, sometimes they say you laugh and you cry. You feel like laughing and crying at the same moment because one sees the joy of awakening and crying of our stupidity of never seeing it before that moment and crying for those who are still slumbering. These are very funny emotions because in that moment, they are not... Um, uh, associated what we normally think of, of our self emotions. So they can freely come. Shifu in his death poem was talking about laughing and crying because this is the way it is for us, but it's not in the same laughing and crying as a sentient being, but as someone that truly wants 
to help others. My goal here is that if you can get a picture of mine, a, a little bit of it, a little taste, that you'll remember that. And you'll know that this moment, this retreat is special. I don't want to teach you how to meditate. As I can see, you all have your legs crossed. So 50% of how to teach you to meditate is already done. I want you to awaken. I want to set out the seeds for you to awaken. And those seeds are kind of bathing you into the proper meditation, listening to the Dharma so that it can go, penetrate through to mind, to generate something inside of you, a memory of your original nature. You have it now. This mind that, that you're using right now to listen to me is your original nature. You have to remember. Sometimes I'll talk to people and they go, I know I've seen you someplace before. And I go, remember, try to remember. You can remember. I'm something, but I can't remember. You can remember. So I'm telling them to put aside their self, to wake up, to see the affinity you've had in another lifetime before this. What I'm trying to do to you now is to awaken you. Awaken what you already have, but you are using it slumbering through this lifetime. This is what I'm doing here. This is my introduction to you. So that you can see I come here very sincerely to try to help you and those that you will you'll help. The lectures I provided for you this uh, um, weekend are lectures that are designed to progress um, along the way to help you to understand. I've chosen to use the ancient Chan masters of Tao Xin and Master Holmgren as a, a point of embarkation to the, the study of, of Chan this weekend. I could pick up any of the masters or the sutras to, to do, but I think that they in particular, as it relates to Chan, will give you a taste of John, a flavor of it, and more importantly, the direction on which to investigate mind. In all that I do, I focus on directing the students to investigate mind, to contemplate mind. I can tell you by words, but without your own contemplation and investigation, you could only be a good John scholar or a good um, um, citizen of samsara. But you will not find a way to awaken. You must take that step to awaken. You listen, let it go to your heart. You will see when we start. This is uh, the fourth Chan patriarch, Master Dao Xin. Master Dao Xin was interesting because he represents a change in the um, in the way in which thing, uh, the the Dharma was presented. And here there was an evolution of asking questions. And this evolution of, of asking a question of the master and the master responding was very good because these questions are be, being fed to the master are the questions of a practitioner of how to, to practice or the questions that you have when you, when you ask me. That's why I'm so patient to allow you to ask questions. Sometimes the 
the presenters don't want to. They just want to give you this information, never let you ask questions. But these questions are questions that are very, very important because these questions, they lead to, to uh, a proper answer. And, and so that's important. I remember one of my students telling me they were asking this one monastic, the questions they would ask in, in, in my classes and they thought, well, this monastic, he'll answer the questions. But after they asked a couple of, of profound questions and the, the monastic would say, why are you asking me all of these tough questions like this? You know, why can't you just listen? And they said, well, these, you know, these questions are the ones that Gilbert answers. And, and, and they're like, like, they didn't know what to say because they weren't used to answering questions. But this process I, I have of questions and answers it dates back to Dao Xin. He was the one who in, introduced these questions of the students to the master so that the master could, could respond to them. And so this went on for a while. And then later on, it evolved into um, these stories, Chan stories of, of the master's interaction with other people, um, as evidenced, let's say, by Matsu and, and, and by Song. You no, know, um, just a couple of hundred years later. But in this this time period, here comes the question. So, so, but before we get to it, he starts this way. When you're sitting in meditation, watch carefully to know uh, when your consciousness starts to move. Consciousness is always moving and flowing. According to its coming and going, we must be, no, we must all be aware of it. So you have to be aware. This is the first element of a proper meditation or the first element of being in a state of chant is be aware of what the mind is doing. This consciousness then, if we return it to mind, then it is something that we can be aware of. If not returning it, we turn mind into consciousness, and then we believe that we are the actor in all of this. But the um, the treatises say there is no actor. The Dharma, uh, Dharma Vibhaga Sutra says there's no agent, no apprehender there. So we have to look at this and say, what does that mean? It means that every moment is a moment that the mind is functioning, but it can function clearly or it can function with obscurations. And the big obscuration that's there is the idea that there's a self that directs all this stuff. But it isn't really a true self. It is just an impression of, of what is the self nature of mind. Use the wisdom of the diamond to control and rule it. Since, it. since it's just like a plant, there is nothing to know. To know there is nothing to know is the wisdom to know everything. Now, that's kind of an all-day sucker uh, line. Let me read it to you again, and then Dion can explain it to you impeccably. To know there is nothing to know is the wisdom to know everything. My dad used to say, I know nothing about nothing. And I was going, oh my God, dad, why do you say something like that? That sounds so stupid. And so I realized how wise it was to know nothing about nothing. It, it's, it is so humble and so wise to do that that you truly know because you don't you don't cling to any knowing. It is just the wisdom naturally arising. He says, this is the Dharma gate of the one form of the Bodhisattva. What he's pointing to here is what is called Ekayana. Ekayana is a Sanskrit word for just mind. And so 
um, sometimes it's referred to as a luminous mind, but it is just saying that everything functions off of mind. And, and so when we know that, then we reverse engineer, which is what Shakyamuni Buddha did. He reverse engineered all of the stuff that how things came into being. And he came up with what? Anybody know? The first thing he taught, nobody knows. The 12 Nadanas, the laws of dependent origination, he reverse engineered all things that appear. So he could see from where they came from, from the grasping desires, all the things that bring forth objects and forms and mental states. And so they, but they all come from mind. Because we've lost that, we have the, the I, idea that we need to perfect this body. We can watch the body, perfect the body, but in some way, we have to understand that this body will yield to its samsaric existence and not long and no longer be here. So we have to be careful, very mindful about how our body works, how our mind works to make the best use of this time. One of the things that Master Xin Yang said that was so obvious about knowing about nothing about nothing, but struck me greatly was he said, you know, you only have a finite of breaths to take. And so he's running you directly into the idea of, of the mortality of this body. He didn't say anything else other than that, but it strikes you because you realize this one breath sounds like a Pink Floyd song, one breath closer to death, um, but it is in this way. And so when you when you understand this, then you make this next breath count and the breath after it count. You don't, um, sorry, because the, the Pink Floyd song coming through my head saying, <laughs> you don't fritter and waste the, you know, the dull day. You know, <laughs> but I guess he was on to something when he was writing a song. Uh, but it's in this way that we we don't we don't waste this day. And the dull day is not knowing what you're doing, whether you're having fun or whether you're you're at work or whatever. We don't do those types of things. We don't try to define our life by all the simple pleasures or the complicated pleasures or go after something that you really thought you wanted but it turned out that you didn't want it because once you got it you still maintain the mind of it of grasping and so now you start thinking of something else so his first question here was what kind of a person is a Chan master? Dao Xin said, someone who is not disturbed either by chaos or serenity is a person with the know-how of good Chan practice. There are people who begin to practice and when they practice, all they do is seek serenity. They don't want to mix with the hoi polloi all the people with the problems, that's just an arcane word saying that common people or lower people, they, they think that they're so high up. Now they don't have to, to, to mix with them because it's too much noise or that they don't, um, on the other one was the chaos of the world. When we're, we're here, there's this chaos. One of the best descriptions of a bodhisattva of uh, a bodhisattva is an enlightened being that um, dedicates their life and rededicates it coming back again and again to the samsaric world um, to 
for the sake of, of delivering sentient beings. Um, in, in terms of his, the description was that there's one foot that's in, in um, samsara and the other one is in mind and they straddle both worlds. So they understand the function is to come back. But they, they, even though they're in a world of chaos, they use mind to keep them clear and on, on the function of why they're here. We, as bodhisattvas and as Buddhas, we can do that. We can be in the midst of chaos, but we use our mind as the proper rudder as to how to navigate through this world, through body, speech, and mind, we can do that. Without that, we are just like a rudderless boat, just bumping into this or bumping into that, or like those amusement park rides of bumper cars where they just keep bumping into different people, random when it appears to be, but it is all connected. If you bump me, I'm gonna go looking for you to bump you back. And that's what life is, is a bumper car ride. When you go home and they say, what did Gilbert teach? Life's a bumper car ride. <laughs> so in any case, it, it is in this way. You hit me, I hit you. Ah, so, so sad. When one always dwells in tranquility, the mind perishes. But if you are always in a state of discernment, then the mind scatters chaotically. Is pretty much was what I was saying. The Lotus Sutra says the Buddha himself dwells in the great vehicle. The power of meditation and of wisdom gives remarkable splendor to the dharmas which he has acquired. These he uses to save all beings. So this is really a function, what we call Mahayana. Maha being very high and Yana being a vehicle. So this is the highest vehicle is to, to see this place like a burning building that we want to get people out. It's not just that simply that we, we run out of the building and we'll go, wow, that was close. Um, I almost burned up. But you look back and you go, wow, there's still people in there. There's dogs, there's there's birds, there's whatever's there that needs to be pulled out. And you go and you do that. You don't worry about what's going to happen to you. There is one bodhisattva, earth store bodhisattva, the, the Chinese will know him as uh, Disan Busa, um, that goes to hell to deliver the hell dwellers. No, it's a hell of a job <laughs> because you're, you're in, in hell all the time. But, but the circumstances of hell do not define that bodhisattva or the ropes don't burn or freeze or whatever. It is just simply the function to deliver. And so that's why they say that, that we, even though we're in the world of chaos, we're not lost in the chaos whatever is there, we, we are clear about it. And um, then the question is, how can an enlighten, how can we be enlightened to the nature of things and our mind attain lucid purity? So they're saying, how do we practice essentially? Daoshan said, neither by trying to meditate on the Buddha nor trying to grab hold of the mind, nor uh, be seeing the mind, nor analyzing the mind, nor reflection, nor any discernment, nor by dispersing confusion, but through identification with the natural rhythm of things. I love this. I, I absolutely love this. Because what, what, what is Tao Shen saying that you should not do? There's a theme to all of what he said. Anybody know? Of course you do. You just don't want to say it. Duality. There's a when we have a duality. If we're seeking the Buddha, 
we already have the Buddha mind. Why are we seeking the Buddha when we have the Buddha mind? We just have to clarify that. But if we we seek the Buddha mind outside of ourselves, then we're it is not good. We can't practice properly. Or analyzing the mind, even though we we, we don't engage in cogitation about the mind, thinking about the mind. We contemplate mind. Where do we contemplate mind? In the present moment. In our awareness. And when we have that, everything works perfectly. But what he's saying is that we do it through identification with the natural rhythm of things. What would be another way of saying the natural rhythm of things? Anybody know? There's bonus points. You guys haven't even got any points yet. <laughs> what is the natural rhythm of things? What What is the Sanskrit word for that? Nobody knows. Okay. Thus it comes to this. <laughs> <laughs> Thusness. Thusness. That's the way it is. So by identification with the natural rhythm of things, there's no someone looking at something. It is just thus. So we say the Tathagata. The Tathagata is just this thusness. And, and so when we see things in this way, it is just that way. It, it's thus. We don't have to take it any further than that. It is the natural rhythm of things. When we see how, how did this happen? You know, and there was, there's no heavy people in there except for me, I think. But anyway, there was one comedian that was saying, um, this this lady, was, she was very, very heavy. And she said, I don't know how I got so fat. And she said, of course you do. You should know. You were there. You were putting in more that than was coming out the other side. That's how you did it. Thus, it, it is that way, the natural thusness of things. If somebody is very skinny, it's because they're they're taking in less and less food. But there's a thusness there. And if your parents were heavy, then you have a chance of being heavy, or likewise, there's all sorts of different things. But we see the clarity of, of of everything is created by the mind. And we understand that. This is Pratika Samapada, causes and conditions never fail. So we see the thusness of everything. If you're in the present moment and somebody says something to you, you measure your words and your responses in accordance with what should be there. And so you, as you measure it, you're looking at the thusness, if I do this, this will produce this. And you go, or I can take option B, if I do this, then this will happen. And so these choices are initially made in an array of different choices that you can make through, through speech uh, and body. Later on, not even that appears it's instantaneous if the mind is settled it simply just delivers what needs to be there in that moment that's the natural rhythm of things it's it's very important about that finally abiding in, in one soul purity the mind spontaneously becomes lucid and pure so this is important because when we say spontaneously it does it by the natural rhythm of things is that if you put down all distractions, all attainments, all desires, all vexations, spontaneously, the mind will become clear. This is something that later comes up with the sixth patriarch, where he talks about subitism, this sudden enlightenment. And the sudden enlightenment it's not there where somebody's walking down the street and all of a sudden they become enlightened just because they are walking down the street. But there's some cause or condition that enables them at that moment to see things just as they are. It's spontaneous, but it's there because of the practice. 
uh, how they practice, whether in that lifetime or the previous lifetime or whatever, but but it's there and, and it, it appears. Some people can see clearly that the mind is lucid like a bright uh, mirror. Some need a year to practice and then it becomes lucid and pure. Others need three or five years and then the mind is lucid and clear. Or some can attain enlightenment by being taught by someone else. The Nirvana Sutra says the nature of the mind of beings is like a pearl which falls into the water. The water is muddy, so the pearl becomes hidden. When the water is pure, the pearl is revealed. This is what we are talking about before this wish-fulfilling gem, sometimes referred to as the Sintamani gem or pearl, um, or just Mani pearl. And, um, and this is our original nature. When when we come in contact with our original nature, then everything becomes clear. It becomes natural of what we, how we respond to people and what we do. Um, so it says the moment we're going to begin practice, how should we contemplate? Now contemplation, it's not cogitation, it's not thinking. Contemplation is directly looking at something and allowing the mind to absorb it um, and, and use trusting that the mind can, can um, see whatever is there and see through it. And Again, here his response was, we must identify with the natural rhythm of things, which is what I just said. The natural rhythm of things is, is just be in accord with mind itself. And this is contemplation. And then he said, should we face um, toward the West or not? Because before there was a strong belief, and this is uh, with uh, the time period with um, the uh, Abhidharma and the Western Pure Land was also appearing in China. And so they're saying, you know, you should face the West um, so that you are, um, you practice it. similar to what the Muslims say that you have to face uh, where Mecca is when you sit to practice, you know? And so people would go, okay, West, I don't know where West is here. <laughs> Where's West? You guys live in Chicago, you must know where West is, which direction, you're that facing, way. You're facing West. I'm facing West. You see, you guys all have to turn around. Now. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I was totally reversed. I thought West was behind me. But in, in any case, uh, that was how people would do that. So do you think that Dao Shen would say, oh, yeah, you guys have to face West when you practice? Let's see what he says. He says, if we know our original mind neither is born nor dies, but is ultimately pure and identical with the pure Buddha land, then it's not necessary to face toward the West. The Wayan Jing, that's a Vatamsaka Sutra, Flower Adornment Sutra. I have to do it in different days. Don't ask me in Japanese. So. <laughs> um, uh, unlimited kalpas of time are contained in a single moment. Unlimited kalpas of time are contained in a single moment. Why is that? Remember, we talked about that yesterday. Because in mind, mind is different than its relativity here, with in particular to one event. And then we start counting out or or the, the cycles of the moons as we we did hopefully you figured out how many moons you old you are but that's how uh time is kept here but in fact um in mind it's different i'll give an example very common example how many of you have had a dream you were in a very involved dream 
And then in that very moment, your alarm clock rang. Raise your hand. Pretty much everybody. So the thing is, is, is that the dreams were pretty extensive. How could they do that? With your alarm clock going off, but you had this very extensive dream. What time frame was that dream operating in? It wasn't operating in this samsaric world. It was operating in the, the dream samsaric world, which evidently passed a lot faster than this samsaric world. Otherwise, you would not be able to wake up. You would have to be there being chased by whatever it is that was chasing you, you know, for, for so long. But you had the dream to, to come to the point to scare you enough to wake you up or whatever it was that was happening. But that happened in a snap of a finger. It could not be that, that you had that dream for, for the whole night unless you your mind calculated, okay, he's going to wake up in eight hours. We've got eight hours to give him a really nasty dream. And then just like a conductor at the very end, there's a big crescendo and a big clasp of, of the uh, symbols and you wake up. Wow. <laughs> and the dream master said, that was a great dream. <laughs> you got it right on time. It was eight hours of the dream. You know, the train pulled into the station is there. But no, it's in one apparent thought moment. I was talking to Michael about thought moments uh, a while back, and, and a whole lifetime of a dream passed in that very moment. How could that be? That's why they were saying here that unlimited kalpas of time are contained in a single moment because mind is in this way. We follow this world, this samsaric world, and we're governed by, by its rules. I throw this up in the air, it's going to fall because of gravity. But in another place, it would just simply float around. Or if I dreamed it, it would float. Now, I can't make it float here. Um, no. And if I did, you guys would probably say, I'm going to follow you for the rest of my life. <laughs> no, don't, don't do that. Because there's, people can do some wild things in this world, but they can only manipulate the idea of reality here. But the thing is, is that it, it is to get you to start looking at this, not from the idea of this dream world, but the idea of mind, that's why he's saying it's mind blowing. Literally, when you say unlimited kalpas are contained in a single moment, what does the sutra say? Or the, um, I don't know, it says to know all the Buddhas of the past, present, and future. Past, present, and future. So it's not saying uh, to know all the Buddhas that are, that are here now. You know, can we line up all the Buddhas that are present right now? but saying of the past and the future to be, then we perceive that all Dharma Dharu nature, all phenomena is created by the mind. That is contained in the idea of that these countless kalpas, kalpas are an uncountable amount of time. Um, they are something that when we, we see it, in a single moment, just like the dream that happened in a single moment, only in mind. You were not in that dream world when you did that. You were not um, really in that dream, were you? Or was that dream real that you were in? If you stopped that dream in that moment that you were in, and you took a poll of all the people that are in the, in the dream, are you dreaming? What do you mean I'm not dreaming? This is real. You, you, you see how big that monster is behind me that's chasing me? I got to keep moving. It's real. It's, I can feel the, its breath on my neck. It's hot. It's real. And you go, but it's a dream. No, it's not a dream. It's real. 
What about this dream? You're so convinced that this is real. But everything that you see here has been created by the mind. You were here. You remember. You know how you got here. To this very moment, you know what brought you here. You're clear about it. You should be clear about it. It was a, I don't know, you know, I I, I was like stumbling around. I, I, this isn't the class to learn how to make a, a marijuana bong pipe. That's why I thought I was at. How did I get here? No, you're clear about how you got here. You're, you know what you're doing. So you just stay awake. Even though you're in the dream, you can stay awake. At the end, you can make a decision. Do you stay and come back and, and start pulling out all the other people that are in this burning dream? Or, or do you just move on? That's your choice, depending on what you practice. So, so that's good. So this is how we see this fleeting world. An illusion, a phantasm. A dream. From the very beginning, these Chan masters were clear about what they were teaching. Why don't we teach this? Why don't we teach this? Why do we just teach people to cross their legs and to, to um, don't think anything? That's stupid. That doesn't help. If somebody is having a bad dream that you see, what do you do? You want to wake them up from the bad dream. And if you're having a bad dream, you'd hope somebody would wake you up, right? And so we say, why? It was just a dream. Well, to those who are in the dream, it matters. It really matters. So we don't withhold the profound to people. We present it to them. In due time, they'll be able to know what to do with this information. But at least they know. At least they know. Master Huang Ning had a realization when somebody was passing by him and had recited one line of the Diamond Sutra to him. He just overheard it, actually, but it clicked. Not bad, because his past practice enabled him to do that. But we, we don't know that. But we should. We should have the opportunity to know that this is a dream. One last part. The Buddha causes beings who have adult capacities to face the West, but does not teach people with keen abilities to do so. So the people who have keen abilities, I would say, you know, if you, you really want to practice and you don't get this, I would advise you just to face the West, okay? Um, and at least you have that part. But you all, as I see it, have a keen ability. Even though you're facing the east, you have a keen ability to know where mind is. It's just in this moment. If you don't know where your mind is, face west, please. Okay. <laughs> Bodhisattvas who have profound practice enter the the stream of birth and death in order to save sentient beings. Okay, so they're saying bodhisattvas, if once awakened, they have a choice to come back here to help others. So they purposely go into the dream. How can they do that? 
Well, the dream was created in mind so they can go anywhere they want. Go back into the dream. And yet do not drown in desire. So they don't go, they don't come back here and then and then become a fallen angel because they start seeing, you know, um, start smoking marijuana or whatever it is, and all of a sudden they forget that they were a bodhisattva. That's an arcane reference to my time in the 60s where marijuana was like the ultimate leader to to crack cocaine and everything. Now people are kind of changing about that. But in any case, it says, um, and I'm not advocating marijuana. Okay. I have to be so politically correct now. Um, now, I want you to think about this because this is what he's saying. They don't drown into that. If you have the view, so this is the view, beings in samsara and, and I am able to save them these beings are capable of being saved. So you come back and you have the idea that I'm going to save these sentient beings and they're capable of being saved. Is that the, the right attitude? How many think it's the right attitude? Raise your hand. One, that's it. The rest of you say hell with them. They're not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, go ahead. I suppose it presumes that one thinks that they're the right one to be the savior. And I don't know if that we have the judgment or to know that maybe at this stage. Well, let's say you're a bodhisattva and you're coming back. So um, Michael, you didn't raise your hand. Are you still with us? <laughs> <laughs> well, why didn't you raise your hand? I'm somewhere. Huh? I'm somewhere. You want to know, did you raise your hand or not? And why didn't you raise your hand? Well, it's like watching a television show, thinking that you're going to save the characters on the screen. Like they're, they're not real. So it says, if you have the view that beings are in samsara, I am able to save them. And these beings are capable of being saved. So you're saying that everybody's like on a television program, why should I save them? Then why does the Bodhisattva come back? Function. To save the the illusory sentient beings on the television? Well, to awaken the mind that there is nothing real there to be saved and that there's no reason to fruitlessly squander away. What is awakened? Mind. You guys trust them? Yes, go ahead. Uh, uh, I guess according to Dharma Sutra, the and the, the Bodhisattva should bear the uh, the mindset that there there isn't uh, any beings that that can truly be saved. To, um, the Bodhisattva is. The real Bodhisattva is the Bodhisattva that uh, uh, discarded uh, the concept of self, the concept of other, the concept of uh, longevity, and the concept of all beings. So you're with him? I am. All right. You at least got one concept. <laughs> <laughs> That's a start. You know. <laughs> so very interesting because this is the part that's very perplexing that bodhisattvas come back to this world to save illusory sentient beings. If we come back to this world to try to say, I'm going to save your carcass and your carcass, carcass being like a body. Sometimes the ancients called them red meatballs. So, so if you look and you see, there's the Buddha there on top of a red meatball, then you'd probably be correctly seeing the things in terms of that but the the sentient being as an individual cannot be saved because it's illusory but yet that which believes it to be a sentient being that is engaged in the suffering is 
word saving because that's mind itself. The very mind that you use now, the mind that's clouded into thinking that this physical property of this body is yours and you have the realm, you know, of this of this body rather than seeing it connected with everything else. So it's very interesting because this represented a major change in, in the thinking in Buddhism of the uh, establishment of bodhisattvas. So this came in um, in the very early Mahayana where you'd have, uh, for instance, the 8,000 line sutra, uh, they, sometimes they call it Asta, but it's like Astarika something, very long name, or the Awakening of the Faith in Mahayana sutras that come in and begin to change the, the, the purpose of what one does with this life. And there we begin to see bodhisattvas uh, coming in and, and practicing. And it's very interesting where, how many of you have, have heard, tell me where you're at, uh, of that one uh, sutra or, or treatise called the, the Awakening of the Faith in Mahayana? Okay. You know, Esther, you know the name in, in Chinese? So we give you a, so the Chinese, if you didn't know what it was, say it again. Okay, so now again, how many have heard of that? That, that Raise your hands. No crocodile hands, put them up high. Or a few of you. It's very interesting because this document where it says waking of the faith in Mahayana, it's not the faith as Mahayana is a faith, but Mahayana, this highest vehicle here, means awakening of faith in the Buddha mind. Mahayana at that time was interpreted to be the Buddha mind or the Buddha vehicle. And so, or sometimes called the greater vehicle. Um, but what it means is the understanding of how mind works. So it all comes back down to that. So here, when we're looking at this, we're seeing that we have to see clearly that everyone is illusory because they belong to the dream. What is sure about whatever's in this dream is it's impermanent it will not um it, it does not really exist um it only appears like a shooting star in the sky um and you see oh there was and it's gone and i saw it though but i know it was just there temporarily but it will come back again and again and again um and what one does then essentially is one takes a ride on the shooting star and tries to get as many, many people out as possible. So if um, there were more bodhisattvas on the Titanic, perhaps they could have saved more people. Um, but it is in this way that, that the bodhisattvas are, are jumping into a sinking ship. Um, Maybe the parable of the burning house is, is more acceptable to some people, but it's the same thing. There is no purchase here. There's nothing that we can hold on to in this lifetime. The masters talk about that, that uh, trying to, to extend yourself in this way is like, like being in an ocean and, and trying to hold on to sea foam. You know, you see the bubbles, you try to hold on to them, but they will not keep you buoyant. So we see the world as it is. This is the dustness of it. The, we do not come in to save the corporal body, but we come in so that those who are slumbering of, with Buddha nature are not set on a course of coming back again and going through the whole procedure time and time again countless lives and we go like well how do we know these countless lives who knows because as they mentioned um countless kalpas can can appear in in one moment it's different mind is different than than that idea 
Okay. And so it says, um, we'll find out if he was right or not. Um, and he says, and these beings are capable of being saved. Then you are not uh, to be called a bodhisattva. Saving beings is similar to saving the empty sky. How could the sky ever have come and gone? So this is illusory beings. So we don't come in to save you, you know, and say, where's your papers? You know, I'm taking you now. You know, um, it, it isn't in this way. It is not you, your corporal bodies that are salvaged. It is you, the mind that's using this body. That is, is that is what is to be um, saved. Uh, and and again, what is to be saved is just simply awaken, awakening to see that this this body is not real. Okay. Um, as a whole, bodhisattvas of the first stage at the beginning have realizations that all things are empty. Later on, they obtain the realization that all things are not empty which is identical to the wisdom of non-discrimination. That's a little too deep for you, so I won't, I won't talk about that. The Heart Sutra says, form is identical to emptiness. It is not because form is eliminated and then there is emptiness. Form, the nature of form is emptiness. So that's the Heart Sutra. Now, I'll give you some further food for thought because originally, that part came from um, the Asta Sutra and another sutra, and it wasn't in that way. They said form is an illusion. They didn't mention emptiness came a little bit later on uh, where um, the translator Kumara Jiva changed the illusion to, um, to emptiness to make it a little clearer. But once again, it's just in this way when we see the form, you know, as as he was saying, you know, sentient beings, they're just an illusion. So anyway, that should give you some food for thought. Some of this is useful for uh, more advanced people. Some of it is just stuff for people that are beginning just to put away in your memory locker and access it uh, as you go along. Some of you, even though you're beginners, are able to pick it up right away. It's okay. You know, uh, remember he said, oh, like, you know, those who have practiced a year, um, three to five years, you know, um, you should be there. But then you go, gosh, I've been practicing for seven years. I haven't gotten nothing yet. So then come and see me after class. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Everything is mine. So why would there still be individual consciousness lifetime? I don't get that. It doesn't fit together. My um, my response to you is classic, John, but I'll try to calm it down so you don't take offense. You will never understand. You will never understand. I once said that to somebody and they walked out. Um, <laughs> so I, I have to be very careful when I say that these days. I learned that when I was very young and teaching it, you know, so that tells you how long ago it was. Uh, but in any case, what it means is that the if we view those kinds of statements from the idea of samsara, it is not understandable. We have to contemplate and and try to break away from the idea of the samsara because it doesn't make sense in the samsara part. But as you begin to contemplate it, and it, it will become self-evident, self-evident being self-evident of the nature of 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 the self, which is the Buddha nature, one contemplating that, and then it will begin to make sense. Um, because the, your idea of the consciousness, um, that consciousness is an illusion. We could call it emptiness, but it's an illusion. It's not really real, but that which is attached to it is it's that is what's called immutable immutable meaning that it never changes which is mind itself but isn't but that everything it connects everything yeah. it connects everything but it, it's not you or your individual sense of identity 
when we're able to let that go, then then the mind becomes accessible again. It's always been there. We just haven't been able to see it because of the, of the fact that the self is getting in the way, this illusory self. But aren't we grasping if we say we come here for endless lifetimes? And are you and you are me? And you know, if 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 we are all mine, we are all the future and all the past. So what we see here are just little tentacles coming out of the mind. Wow. You're like reciting like the, the Beatles song. <laughs> I am you and we are me and we're all together. <laughs> <laughs> it there's no duality sorry <laughs> you can see where i came from rock and roll orientation but but when you see that you know the beatles were that's why they messed it all up because they were taking drugs but they were onto something and all of a sudden they go i am the walrus you know <laughs> <laughs> and they messed it all up at that point <laughs> but um you know all of that stuff there if you're you're on to something you're on to something with that and, and that's why i say this stuff there's no answer that i can give you where you go oh wow that was it you know and then i punch your ticket okay and you go okay you could go no it isn't in this way it it is in the way of of you contemplating that and, and sorting it out. Like you've got parts of it say, well, it's connected. And you say, yeah, it's connected, but it's connected in a way where we need to let go of the self, this illusory self, to be able to penetrate how that works. And then when we look at it, what we do is we move ourselves out of, of the, the dream to be able to see the dream. And when that happens, you'll find that the some start realm is infinitesimally small it's so small in relation to to the infinite of the mind and then you go you know you want to go back you know but there's people that are suffering okay i'll go back and then you go back but you know the difference or you come in and you're slumbering for a while and all of a sudden you wake up you awake you remember you remember this you've been here you've done it you just have to remember and, and you awaken. Oh, now I remember what I was doing here. I'm supposed to awaken other people. That was your prime directive, but you did, you forgot it somewhere along the line that you're here to awaken people. So you, this is what you do. You go, oh, I remember now. But that sounds like if there would be a soul, and that doesn't make sense to me. There, there is no soul, and there is no prime um perfect buddha that lives up in buddha land there's so many buddha lands i mean but all that's just a um uh, um, in mind okay but the thing is 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 that what we have to do and what you're thinking about is exactly what you should be thinking about at this point and looking at it because it's a challenge to your idea of this world being real because the hardest thing is to tell a person to wake up from the dream when they believe that that they're not in a dream that's very difficult because they're, they're clinging to the dream because that's all they know and so they go this is reality you know this is wood you know i know it you know whatever it is and so they they self-prove but to tell people aren't you just move away for a second think about this and think this might be a dream what if it was a dream and it begins to undercut the idea of that of the self-existence independent self-existence it that's not going to happen where you're going to be taken away you know um to another land or whatever you're just going to see what happens and even if i'm wrong about all of this being compassionate towards people and using wisdom you can't be that far off i i know where you're at and and it's a, actually a good place because all of a sudden you you were you were walking and you were following me right and all of a sudden the boards that you're walking on over the water become very unsteady and you're going, I don't know if I want to walk any further here because, you know, I'm losing my balance. 
But that's where you should be. You should be there. You should be be feeling a little uncomfortable about that because it's natural. So we follow the natural order of things, and that's part of the whole process. Okay. So keep your questions and ask them again later. Just uh, contemplate them for a little bit. Any other last questions? Yes. Uh, I have a question about uh, the uh, totality of the mind when, when you have this, uh, the, the, the sort of predis predisposed the concept here is the mind that is all encompassing, includes all the, the future, present, past, and you know, all the occurrences, potentials that start to disappear. We draw it on the board the other day. The other day. So, so um, uh, logically speaking, when you have a, a, the concept of space, it is incapable of perceiving itself because it has no others uh, as, as a reference point that could reflect its entity. So, but experientially, I, I'm, I'm assuming once you get to the advanced level and you really perceive the mind as it is, you have that sense of uh, you're, you're still perceiving something. So yeah. How, 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 how can we reconcile this? Well, let, let me do this one last part, will you? Yeah. Great. See, but I put them on the right side here. It's multiple color. Okay. Uh, you can have the lights. When. When you have, let's say, we'll draw that half circle again like this, and let's say this is different matters, different appearances in mind, and you are sitting there, you're viewing them. At any given point in time, you can only pull one of them. If you have a method, if, if all of a sudden you view something else, the method drops off. And you're only on that. And then you go to this one over here, then this one drops off. So you're thinking linearly, or you might think, oh, you know, this is the donut. Okay. So then you go, oh, I want, you know, a strawberry donut. You know, and you have a picture of a strawberry donut. And I, I know where I can get it at Dunkin' Donuts. I don't know if you have Dunkin' Donuts here, but you know there. And then you say, I'm going to drive there right after class and pick one up right and i'm going to take it home and i'm going to eat it you know <laughs> picture of a pac-man eating the donut <laughs> and then this is linear thinking this is the thinking of samsara okay you're only capable of doing that and if for some reason you heard a noise as you were doing it it would break the stream and then you'd hear this noise just you know maybe music i put a little note here what was that? And then this fades out, and you go, like I was saying, I'm going to eat my donut, and then you continue on. But it's linear, so that noise would, would actually come in here and break up this, but you're, that's why they say that you have to sever the mind that desires continuation. So what happened to your method? It's gone. It said, Duncan Donuts, if you want to find it. Okay. <laughs> so so this, is, this is the mind of an illusory sentient being, it creates like this. It creates, but it's not really creating. Who's really creating this? This is not the person, you know. If this was in the Wizard of Oz, it would be that face that's going, go, go. And 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 it's the little person behind the curtain, which is mine, that is controlling all of this, but making this illusion that there's a person here. Now, if we don't use the mind in this way, because this is only in samsara that it, things happen in this way, that we have this linear thinking. If in a single moment, countless kalpas can appear, in a single moment, countless mental impressions can appear, but only in mind. And mind is capable of having command of all of those appearances, not linearly, but simultaneously, because it's mine. It created it. How would it not know if in your body, you know, you, you go and you, um, 
and your leg fell asleep or your foot fell asleep and and did it have to travel up to the knee and then to the to the pelvis what's wrong the foot fell asleep tell them to move it you know what's wrong it goes up to your stomach says, oh there's a problem down below you know pass it on until it finally gets up here and, but no just like a body the dharma body knows it instantly that the foot's asleep it doesn't have to make these link connections to get there it knows instantaneously what is happening there how about the left foot oh he's okay because it knows instantaneously about any other complaints you know i want a donut i can so so the thing is is that it's that way it knows about all these things all these cravings all these manifestations simultaneously we don't know that because we we got like the dumbed down version of the computer code, <laughs> you know, so our computer works very, very slow. You're working on like a 10 D, you know, 4K computer from, you probably don't know what that is, um, but it's like the first computers that came out and go, wow, it's got 4,000, 4,000 gigabytes? No, it's 4,000 bits. <laughs> <laughs> And that's what we're using is the slow down computer. But mind itself is instantaneous. It's capable of that. I can be talking to you. I know you guys are heads are bobbing and bobbing going, it's time for a break. <laughs> <laughs> Your mind is capable of doing that. Just this very mind that you're using right now, it can do that. It just doesn't follow things linearly. When we try to process stuff linearly, it's slow. So if you're trying to process what you're thinking about slow, I mean, it would be like, okay, let's make this shipment on, on a boat to China. You know, is it there yet? No, it's, it's getting there. You know, it's on a slow boat to China and you can't process fast enough. But, but if you let go of it, let the mind process it, boom, in an instant, it's there. That's why Huayin Ning was talking about instant enlightenment or sudden enlightenment. You don't have to go through all these mental processes to get there. Or like you were saying, the, the stairway to heaven of building and building and building and, and making this perfect person like Confucianism. You don't have to do that. You just have to see in, in, in a snap of the fingers and it's there. Wow, it's there. They call that awakening. Not bad. It, it, it's better because you have all the fast versions and and all the updates instantaneously. So not only do you, you get all like all of the, the the versions of mind from before, you know, but you already get instantly the updates in the future that haven't come out yet. It's not bad. It's mind. It can do anything. But we don't know that. So we sit and crave a, a Dunkin' Donut. Okay, that gives you some food for thought. No questions? You're doing all right? Okay. All right, we'll take a break. This is a long break you can go to. So when, um, when you stand up, uh, fold your towel, put it on top of your cushion, and we're walking clockwise. So oh, we'll hold on. Two. One one correction. You, you, we stand. Then we bow to the Buddha, and then you bow to the, the, the lecture.
So this should be true for a lot of articles. Mm -hmm. It's okay. It, it, it worked out pretty good. We got the, I got the blood flow refresh to sit mm -hmm. and guide meditation. So then they'll be back here at 11 and then 12 is the it's, it's lunch. It's lunch. So you want to go and I'm going to take the meal offering. So we finish up uh, 12. Uh, so no, no, it's eleven fifty. Yeah, eleven fifty. Uh, just the the meal genus and then uh, the five transformation. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. So what page is that? Uh, seven and eight. So it's at the very back. So yeah. All right. So then we do that, and the people do do the piece, and then we can go from there. Right. And also then. Um, You can do 25 minute periods. Okay. But the the other one is a um is just a short break. So you just say, you know, uh, this is a short break. Uh, uh you could do not get up off the cushion. If you need to straighten up or, or massage your legs, you can, and then return to sitting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, those who do not need a break can continue to sit. Okay, so 25 and then then the, the short break and then another 25. Yeah, and if, if if there's people that are still moving after five minutes or so, then you start with the wooden fish. But there's no need to do the wooden fish if everybody is in sitting. Yeah. Okay, so you just kind of watch over it and see how it works. And then, then we'll keep going. Okay. All right, so, so far so good today. <laughs>